get started with our, our second full panel of the day. Um, and we know that people will probably be wheeling in and all of that, but we're just going to go ahead and, and get going here. So this particular panel, we've already been talking a lot throughout this conference. You know, we've had this kind of emerging theme, not only of the, the ethical questions that journalists face in covering issues of gender and sexuality, but also the, the various challenges that journalists themselves face as gendered and racialized subjects, um, as human beings who are, are coded and read in a certain way by other people. And that's really what this panel is going to be talking about a lot more today. I am Lindsay Palmer. I'm a, an assistant professor who just got tenure. <laughs> Court Associate um, in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. I'm a researcher who focuses especially on international journalism. And we've got three absolutely amazing panelists who I'm going to go ahead and introduce to you. So first of all, sitting here closest to me is Dr. Michelle Ferrier. She's the Dean of the School of Journalism and Graphic Communication at Florida a and University and the founder of Trollbusters.com, which I'm ecstatic for her to be talking about with us today. Barry was named one of the top 20 journalism innovation educators for 2018, and she conducts research around online communities, media entrepreneurship, and digital identity and reputation management. And then sitting next to her is John Sawyer, who's the founding director of the Pulitzer Center. The center promotes in-depth engagement with global affairs through a support of quality journalism and an innovative program of outreach and education. So he'll be bringing you know, this, this sort of international perspective for us today, as well as the perspective of someone who's been working with journalists based here in the United States and abroad for many, many years. Um, and then last of all, sitting to his left is Christina Carl, who is a senior editor for the Major League Baseball coverage at ESPN, a member of the Baseball Writers Association of America since 09, and was one of the founding members of the baseball think tank, tank Baseball Perspectives. And she also came out publicly as a transgender woman in 2003, becoming the first out trans woman working in sports journalism, and has, has engaged in a great deal of activist work on that also that I'd love for us to hear about some today as well. So I want to kind of, you know, I want this to be a panel that's very much open um, to audience discussion, and I hope everyone's ready to kind of jump in. I have a few um, questions just to start us off with, though. The first thing I kind of want to think about is this question of what journalists face when they're working with their own colleagues. So, you know, the title of this panel, we're kind of gesturing at this question of bias in the newsroom. The, the term newsroom might be a little bit limiting in some ways because many times journalists are working out in a distant field, maybe somewhere overseas from where the newsroom is really located, or they're out, you know, amongst the people at a protest. They're not in the newsroom, but they're, they're networked with their peers and with their sources, and in those networks they can face these different types of biases. So I'd like to ask each of you today if you'd first of all be willing to share a story. We're going to start with stories, individual stories, and then go a little bit more deep structural, the way we were kind of talking about earlier. Start with a story about a time that you either experienced or witnessed some kind of gender-based bias um, from a colleague, something that, that you would be willing to share and what we can kind of learn from that. I want to start with the stories because they bring these kind of individual um, and, and sort of, you know, like deep, specific elements of this kind of thing to light. But then I want you to sort of comment also on how you think that those stories relate to these broader structural problems, the broader trends that you see when we think about gender as a journalist working with other journalists. I'll just start with you. Great. Um, so, um, as uh, Lindsay has mentioned, I work with Trollbusters, but uh, some of my earlier experiences working in the newsroom was at the daytime Washington News Journal over 12 years ago. Um, I was uh, the first African American columnist um, to write for the newspaper and experienced a great deal of hate mail as a result. Um, I want to talk about my experiences though before I was a columnist as a night news editor on the desk and an experience of gender in a variety of ways. Um, if you recall several years ago, there's a story that comes out on an annual basis about the top 10 richest people in the world. And usually that list is uh, composed of white males around the world. And this particular year, uh, Oprah had actually broken into the ranks of one of those top people. 
Um, but the AP story that moved across the wire that night represented all white men. And I said, here we are in the United States with one of the most powerful women of color in the world breaking into this list, and we don't have her represented in the story at all. We don't have her represented in the images at all. And so I went to the desk editor and I said to him, um, I'm, I'm working on the Nation page. Um, I really want to bring in Oprah. It's important to our audiences, not only as a woman, but as a woman of color. And he said, no, just go ahead and you know, lay out the story with the AP story, with the graphic that they moved. And I was like, but this is, this is an important angle for our audiences, especially in the US. Um, so I went back to my desk stewing. <laughs> um, I'm not one to take no for an answer. So I went back to him and I said, look, I found the picture of Oprah. I can go ahead and incorporate it with the graphic. Can I go ahead with this? He says, no, go ahead and just run it, run it straight. Went back to my desk, continued to stew. I just went ahead and, and redesigned the page to include Oprah. And I went back to him a third time and I said, here's the page. If you want it done, you're going to have to redo it yourself. Um, it's important that she be represented here on this page. And so, what I found uh, was being uh, one of the few people of color in the newsroom that when I was at work, I was battling with uh, sometimes my reporters about their representations of people of color or women in the newsroom. I was writing with my own editors on the desk about representation. Um, another instance where the sports page, um, the women's uh, softball team at a local HBCU had made it into um, the top ranks of, of um, uh, national competition. And somehow um, our sports reporters had managed to uh, source and put on the front page of the newspaper an image of only the white women on the team. And I'm sitting there going, this is an HBCU, wait a minute, how, how does that happen? Um, and went back and looked at the photo archives and found a photo, and they had actually cropped out the women of color. And I went stomping into the source desk and said, this is inappropriate, there are other photos here, and I made them change the photo. Um, and we actually had to stop the presses that night and make them redo the page because I wasn't standing for it. And so the challenge is of not only being a person of a limited person of color in the newsroom, but I was also terrified on the nights that I didn't work about what was going to get in the paper the next day because I was the one that was going to hear it from um, my community of color who knew me and recognized me and would say, how come the newspaper did that tonight? And I'd be like, I don't know what was there. <laughs> um, and so um, as, a, as a person of color in the newsroom, I think it's a real challenge as well as being a woman in the newsroom make sure that the representation in our paper is uh, balanced, gender-wise, racially, et cetera. Well, it's great to be here. Um, I'll tell a story that I think is really more uh, maybe gender blinders than, than, than bias uh, from my own experience. And, and I think I'm very much, I have to acknowledge, I'm speaking, I'm the guy that Carl Swisher was talking about is, you know, lived his career in, uh, in unconscious um, enjoyment of, of white male privilege and, and needs to be constantly reminded, and, and, and I have been uh, over and over again, uh, the, the things that I don't see, that people like me don't see, and how important it is that we bring those things out into the open and, and discuss and learn from them. For the last several years, I've been a member of the board of directors of the National Press Foundation, in Washington, and, and we give out awards every year, and there, there are workshops for journalists uh, from all over the country who participate in that's a great organization. Uh, last year, and it's part of the Me Too movement, when the stories came out about Charlie Rose, uh, we had given him the, what's called the Sol Tishkoff um, broadcast, Broadcaster of the Year Award uh, two years earlier. And so the question for the board was what do we do about it when these appalling stories came out about what Charlie Rose had done? And in the discussion on the board, I began from the standpoint of saying, well, we're not the we're not the Kremlin, we're not going to we gave him this award, we want to issue a statement deploring the behavior, but do we take away, do we rescind the award, and it felt to me like that was sort of you know, rescinding our own history and not acknowledging that we had given this award and we had to own up to it and sort of say, well, why have we done it, what we learned from it. And then we had one of the more 
probably the most open, traumatic uh, discussion that, that I had in the five or six years that I've been on that board. And it's a board that at the time was uh, the, the president of the organization was a woman, the, the membership of the board was, I think, about half men, half women. And the stories that the women told, and these were, were leaders in American journalism, some who go on to PR and others who were still in journalism, the stories they told about their own experiences in, in newsrooms and their career, and, and, and some of them, two of them, actually stories about the, where they had been in broadcast and they were aware of what Charlie Rose had done. And, and when we discussed giving the prize two or three years earlier, uh, none of those concerns were expressed. And so my first reaction was, well, why, why did this not come up when we were talking about the prize? There were people in the room on the board who knew about it. And the, the women said basically that they were not felt that the power dynamics of the media were such that even on this board where we were all serving as equals and part of each other, they all knew that there was a general awareness so we did, we had a lot of respect for each other, they were not comfortable bringing up the issue. And so we ended up, we did rescind the award and we put out a statement that's on, on the Press Foundation site still, but, but it was a, uh, yet again, another reminder to me of how different the world can look if you're a man, a woman, a person of color, whatever, whatever gender you might happen to be, that, that you can never assume that everybody is simply a sharing, telling you what they're really thinking, because they may feel that in the dynamic of the room that you happen to be in, that it's just not a comfortable place to do well, I, I think I can come at this in a couple of different ways. But I think the most entertaining story is having seen the work in professional sports on both sides of the gender divide. Um, I was certainly struck by the, I would say, the perverse feedback loops you get um, coming out as trans when the first time I returned to the press box after I had transitioned, I opened my school book, and the AP reporter sitting next to me is turns and says, do you need help like learning how to keep score? <laughs> it's a work with score books, so it's like a really complicated, non-normal, like professional. <coughs> so it's like I'm halfway through it. I'm like, dude, nobody else is filling this out. It's like, thanks, but okay, you validated me as that you see me as a woman and you <laughs> <laughs> so you know right away you get caught up in things like that. And certainly that was my experience with my readers as well, where suddenly automatically in changing my body line from Chris or Christina, I certainly got a lot more, wow, you're really dumb. You just don't know much about baseball, do you? You know, I know more about baseball. And you're doing this well. You're a woman, you know. I'm like, okay, validating but also wrong. Um, but the value, I think the perspective of being trans can also come up in the newsroom. What I think the most striking examples was, of course, the um, the Dr. B story that ran in Franklin some years back. And that story was was of a inventor who had designed a cutter who happened to be trans and who had um, in the course of promoting this product had misrepresented her credentials and claiming to be a NASA like a NASA scientist and had gone to um, a bunch of other things. And she essentially invented a backstory. Um, and professional golfers really respected her putter and her invention and liked it and endorsed the product. Um, not everybody knew that she was trans, or if they did, they had accepted her and didn't really care. However, Gremlin, in doing this story, um, she got increasingly frightened that um, her identity as a trans person would come up as an element of the story because it had come up in the course of the reporter's investigations and her interventions. Um, she subsequently committed suicide, and whether that was related to the story or not is something that never really got looked into. However, um, Grantland sat on this story for a while after her death and thought, well, you know, how do we want to write this or publish this? Or what are we going to do with this story? And so 
they released it, but they did it in a kind of way that um, revealed not merely insensitivity to whether or not she was trans, but also equated her transness with her potentially misleading you know, people about her credentials and put these up as you know part of the grift and as well as erasing the acceptance that she had found among people in the professional world. So it was a deep problematic story, like one run at Brantland. And the thing that was frustrating about that in particular is Brantland is a spinoff from ESPN. And me working in my side of the in Major League Baseball, I had no idea that this story was coming out or that it had been worked on or created. And they had been consulted as the one trans editor at ESPN. And so they ran the story, and then there was a lot of initially kind of like tentative, like, oh, this is such a strange and curious story, followed by, no, oh, this is a really screwed up and horribly done story, and a lot of the misrepresentations that it made. Um, and so that became like an instant like, flurry of phone calls where I reached out to my chain of command and said, so you guys are going to need help talking about this, and you probably also need to talk about like what's wrong with the story, frankly. And so I need to put me in touch with the folks at Grant, which was particularly frustrating because I knew those guys. And the fact that they had no company and thought that you would probably benefit from a perspective from the inside of how to do this kind of story if you're going to do it at all. And instead, it ended up being a huge black guy for the company, but also a story that became one of those things that I think trans people are a little too familiar with, which is these courtship teaching moments where you have to pivot into saying, like, okay, well, this is what was wrong, somebody's dead, but what do we learn from this and how do we avoid this kind of problems? So these are each such layered and complicated stories. And I think there, there's, as someone who loves to interview people for my own research and, and to hear stories and to try to think of ways that, that these stories can kind of combine to really show us broader things as well about, about the culture of news reporting. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts now on how you think these experiences speak to some of these broader problems, most especially the broader problems of how journalism industries treat journalists when it comes to gender, race, and sexuality. <laughs> That's not more like an exam question. <laughs> that, that, that's just like a whole seminar in of itself, right? Um, so the work that I do with Robustics is really, um, in many ways, um, intersectional. And so dealing with gender, race, uh, religion, uh, geography, um, and other issues that end up complicating the personal identity of the journalist who's there doing the job, and yet they also physically um, and in their writings perhaps represent a particular kind of view. Um, one of the biggest challenges that I've found in the research that I'm doing is our own professional culture. Um, when I was being attacked in the newsroom um, and receiving these uh, racist manifestos, um, it wasn't something I could talk about. It wasn't even something I could write about in my own columns, even though I had a forum and a place to be able to do that. Um, there wasn't a way in our professional culture because I couldn't even use the kinds of words that were being logged at me through the mail um, in the newspaper. So how do I talk about something when I can't use the words to talk about it? Um, and so it becomes a very frustrating kind of situation where you have a voice, but yet you can't even use language to be able to describe what's happening to you. And so um, my colleagues in the newsroom and management really didn't understand what was happening to me, even though this was during the time of, um, of Ryson and letters going to newsrooms and um, attempting to threaten and intimidate journalists. Um, I was getting this mail in, in the newsroom, and the solution of management was take somebody to your car with you when you meet at 1.30 to 2 o'clock in the morning. And that was the solution. And I'm like, that does not solve this problem when somebody's saying they're going to come kill me. So um, I think when we look at the professional culture, our own 
journalists don't want to be the story. They want to be able to tell the story. Um, and it's a very awkward position to be in the place where you are now the subject of the story and having to try and represent that. Um, when we look at the biggest challenges though in this space, particularly for the kind of gendered violence that we see online, um, again, it's difficult for women to tell the story. What we have seen in the work that I've done, <laughs> as Kara says, it was before there was a World Wide Web, I was on the internet and uh, watched as these online communities grew and understood that the dynamics of those spaces brought the white patriarchy as well as the misogyny right online um, in a way that uh, was trying to shut down diverse voices of women and people of color online. And so the behaviors that we're seeing now manifesting more visibly are things that um, people of color, particularly women of color, have been experiencing online for many, many years. And we have been screaming about it to management, to platforms, to government, to uh, officials, etc., even for our professional organizations who have um, basically, um, the response is, just suck it up. This is, this, you're a journalist, just suck it up. This is part of the job. And yet the ways in which women are attacked is very different than men online. Yes, men receive the same. The ways in which women are attacked are very vicious, very violent, um, with rape and death threat imagery and other kinds of back channel stalking, etc. cetera, um, attacks on their family, um, doxing and swatting and other kinds of activity that put them personally as well as their extended family and friends at risk. And to dismiss that as part of the job, I think, um, has been a deep, deep um, stain on the profession of journalism to not recognize the ways in which this continued persistent behavior has damaged the ability of women journalists to be able to do their jobs, to be able to tell the stories they need to tell, to be able to protect their sources and their own families, and to be able to continue to persist in this work. Um, the research that we've recently done uh, with the Trollbusters and the International Women's Media Foundation has said that um, at least one third of the women who are in journalism have considered leaving the profession as a result of the kinds of attacks that they've received online. So the behavior is working to silence women across the board. And I think um, we're aware of it more now, especially within the past two years. Um, but I think uh, we still have a long way to go to come up with solutions to be able to deal with this, not only in the newsroom, but in our digital culture. Well, I, one of the lessons that, that I would draw from the stories that we're all telling uh, is the importance of intentionality and, and uh, being proactive in how we respond to these issues. In, in our case, I mean, the Pulitzer Center is a nonprofit journalism and educational organization. We do a lot of granting to journalists. About 200 journalists a year get funding from the Pulitzer Center. We meet once a week and we look at the proposals coming in. And we're very proud of our commitment to diversity, diverse voices, and all that. Uh, and then what we realized a couple of years ago is that, that we had a problem, and that the uh, and it was brought to our attention by by one of the younger members uh, of our staff, actually the Chinese national herself. And she said, well, you know, your numbers are not nearly as good as they should be, which is you put together the numbers, and in 2016, I think that roughly. 16, 18% of, of our grants overall uh, were going to persons of color. And at that point, about the numbers on gender were better, maybe 40, 45%. Uh, yeah. and, then, and then we started you know, doing things, sort of changing our procedures and, and became much more, made that much more a conscious part of our consideration, not only of the proposals, but going out to solicit proposals. And so we sent her and a senior editor uh, to each of the conventions uh, the beginning of that year, and we've done it since, uh, of the minority journalist associations. And, and had the senior editor there to receive, we solicited, we advertised, well, we want to hear your pitches for proposals. We really want these proposals on local issues of lo local global importance. 
And, and we got at those conventions, when people signed up and on the spot, we had you know, 10, 15 uh, pitches at the, for our senior editor. He came out with really, some really good pitches that we got. And then some of those then came into the system, and then we, we um, approved a number of those projects. We have a ways to go, but we, we more than doubled the percentage of, of the grants, uh, grantees who are uh, persons of color, and so the, on the, and, and we did that, you know, really through. The, it, it, it's remarkable that you could have that significant an increase. And so we also did things like we began to, to bring in. We did these meet and greets with in Washington of, of, of senior editors from the Post or Fox or, or the New York Times, whatever, bringing them in so that they would hear about the Publishers Center and say, look, we have a resource, we have money we can give for grants. We know that you and your organizations are struggling with diversity yourself of increasing diverse voices. Use the Pulitzer Center, use the media, let your own junior staff know people, people of, of, of color, you know, gender, diverse gender view, whatever, let them know that there, there is the possibility of support here. Get them to, to encourage them, tell them to back them. And, and so we began to get those kinds of proposals. And then as that discussion has continued, uh, Ken mentioned in the previous panel that, there, that there's a, we're discussing now the issue of do we pay interns enough to assure that there's socioeconomic diversity, that, that um, we've always paid interns, but the question is do we pay them enough that we can uh, draw from the large enough pool of people the people we want. And we're also talking in terms of our educational outreach when we send people, our grantees, out to uh, colleges and universities. Are we sending the diverse journalists that many of these colleges and universities need to see if we want to have applications um, from minority groups, from diverse populations? We have got to represent that when we're sending out people so that we're not just sending out a bunch of journalists who are well-established veteran people who look like me, they need to look like the whole rest of the world. So that it's been a lesson that we've been far from over with this process. It's, it's, not, it's, not, a, it's not something that you want some time. Uh, but from my side, looking at it as sort of the, the leader of the organization, it's really been striking as to what can be done. You just sort of decide that's a goal, and then you go about trying to achieve it. Yeah. It's interesting to me because even with the best of intentions, I mean, an work at ESPN and as an organization that we have, I think still an ultra majority of women editors working in sports journals and for the entire country, which is, you know, considering every other possible outlet and every possible outlet, ESPN has an outright now, which is crazy. Um, and But great for us. On the other hand, we still run into issues like, you know, years ago at outside the lines. Uh, they had a debate, it's a debate format, but they had a show about trans athletes in high school. And um, they had a panel for the two, uh, two participants going mono me mono moderated by Bob Lee, um, were Sid Ziegler, a cisgender gay sports journalist, uh, was out sports and wonderful guy, but not a trans person, uh, not somebody who was necessarily best equipped to talk about trans issues, and a lawyer from the heat who paid it up. So it was not really a, you know, in terms of serving the needs of the audience, if you didn't know anything about this subject, you weren't going to learn a lot about this subject by having these two panelists or somebody who had really a perspective on trans issues, whether it was a parent or a coach or somebody in education. Coming from one of the large school districts that have accepted trans kids for over a decade and had any public issues. I mean, when they wanted to make it a conversation about public policy or about trans people or about inclusion, you could have gone a lot of different ways. But when you populate a show with two people who really aren't prepared to discuss the subject either effectively or in case of the lawyer guy, like honestly, then you run into a major problem. Um, now that's gotten better. Of course, now you have somebody like Kate Barnes writing about trans issues for his people. I'm sorry, they do a wonderful job. And um, it's into the kind of so I mean, I did a, new, a couple of news about like 
you know, what policy proposals have meant for, you know, educators, for administrators, for kids' participation. And so, you know, doing very, you know, sort of the number of stories on the subject. So it's because, again, when you're talking about mainstream audience, you just kind of have to assume an element of understanding about ignorance. And so if you're going to educate people, you have to really, you know, you can borrow your word, uh, intention, be very intentional about, like, basically providing people with background information, whatever they need to be able to understand and so little bit of a um, But I think it also, particularly when you're talking about trans issues, it gets very difficult when you're looking at you know, media behavior. Uh, I'm reminded of, you know, there's a media discussion group uh, whose existence uh, was created, like, brought forward a couple years ago uh, called Populous, where a bunch of left-leaning journalists talk about trans issues without having any trans people present to talk about trans issues. We were providing a perspective. And it's not because there are no trans journalists. It's because they pointedly don't invite any trans journalists, and they talk a lot of smack about trans journalists currently. <laughs> Which, you know, like, okay, but I don't really need for you to have a call it, you know, making fun with misgendering people. Uh, I don't really need to see basically promoting Set, like pretty second rate or worse journalism as the definitive top, take on a topic, but the fact that these folks then have this debate and conversation about trans people and they talk about trans people in media and then don't have any responsibility to actually doing better um, is pretty frustrating. But it's also then kind of like, you know, even this isn't about political divide, it's about people who are comfortable with doing their talk badly. And they're not serving the interests of their audience. It's still a moving frontier where we see a lot of progress if some people would actually decide to learn about the subject. I mean, that's where, you know, theoretically journalists are supposed to be in their practice, but journalists people would not do that. And just so there's another side of that that I think worth noting a bit is that sort of in terms of what about being sensitive to the audience. And that works, I think, also for the, for the audience that is coming at the, the reporting from a very traditional point of view. And, and, and this is and they're constantly trying to grapple with new facts, new social phenomena that we didn't know. And, and when I grew up in, in, in the Latin in the South, I know a lot about bias and blinders and sort of and, and, and what and having you know, been a child there in the nineteen fifties and seeing attitudes then versus you know, how attitudes have changed over, over the years. There's a story I was thinking about listening to that about in the in the early nineties when Bill Clinton was elected in ninety three it was one of the first big marches in Washington for gay rights. And I covered that march for the for the St. Louis newspaper the post dispatch office they were working for. It. And I met several couples from St. Louis, wonderful people, and, and they had come out as, for this occasion. And it was very dramatic for them and really heroic in many ways. And the and I thought I told my editors afterwards that I want to go back to St. Louis and do long profiles of it ended up being three couples. Um, from different social economic classes in, in St. Louis, but, but um, committed couples. And and so I did, so the paper let me do that. And I went back and I spent a week or two with, with each of these couples. And, and I wrote and talked to their family members of their children, two of the three couples had children. And, and I wrote, my, I, my hope was to humanize their experience and basically say these are normal St. Louis and just like you. They just happen to have different, um, different lifestyle, and then you have know, different, they're different, and their, their, their families are different, and they just something we want to get used to. So we, so then we had a photographer. We did this. We did like a full page and a half in the newspaper of I thought one of the better stories I had written. So the story comes out on a Sunday morning, and all hell breaks loose. And why? Because the one thing none of us thought about at the paper putting together the story that we've been working on for weeks was that we happened by chance to run the story on the front page on Mother's Day. And all the mothers in St. Louis who were not used to the idea of gay rights, gay marriages, they thought that this was the liberal post dispatch and rubbing their noses in something that they were not ready for and that, that, that we were not sensitive to where they were. And, you know, as journalists, you have to sort of 
figure out how do you meet people? How do you actually? I was trying with that in mind and, and, and best I could to, to, to sort of accomplish that. But you have to be aware of so many factors about where other people are coming from and, and their uh, even their readiness. And they're, they're, they're always the audience will always leap to assume that you did something with malicious intent, that you had some underlying purpose, and often you did. I think it's really interesting, you know, that we're we're talking about the audience in some ways here. And you know, when we think about journalism ethics so often, what we're thinking about is what do journalists owe their audiences? So often that's kind of the, the key thing that we talk about, transparency, neutrality, if that's if that's possible. Um, you know, all, all of the different rules that we have that kind of lead us to offer something credible to our audiences. So I'm interested to hear though, I mean, just to really overtly kind of name together why this you know, question of the treatment, the racialized and gendered treatment of journalists is an ethical question. What what is what really gets to the ethical element of this in your view? And we'll, we'll close with, with that question for me and then we'll go out to the, the audience here, but what do you think about the, the role of ethics in this whole conversation? I really think that, um, so I am a survivor, a Me Too survivor. Um, actually the campus rape. Um, and I think it's critically important that as survivors we tell our stories because it becomes very difficult for us to be able to um, understand the patterns of behavior that are happening if we can't draw the lines between the dots. And um, as Linda Steiner mentioned in the previous panel, we, we treat these stories as episodic and one-offs. Um, and because of um, the silencing that happens within the profession, the silencing that happens in the fear of retaliation, um, women don't come forward with these stories. People of color don't come forward with these stories. And so management doesn't understand um, the ways in which um, that silencing um, continues to traumatize people and move them towards PTSD um, and deep, deep psychological and emotional trauma. Um, there's a there's an obligation and there's a delicate balance between being obligated to tell that story so that we can create the patterns and then the retaliation that can come as a result of that and the retaliation is is very real um, and as an administrator having to now deal with sexual assaults um, of my students um, on campus. Um, my absolute fear, as well as disgust at the inability for us to be able to find a way to disclose this information in a way that we can begin to draw patterns, whether it's student assaults or professors or others, um, it's unconscionable that we allow people to uh, be exposed to our young women and other places and uh, let that behavior persist for years and years and years, oftentimes derailing uh, these young women in their careers and keeping them from um, really um, being able to express themselves. So I think the ethical dilemmas um, are really critically to balance um, the privacy needs and understanding of the privacy of the people who experience these things and giving them the choice and agency to make the decisions about where and how they disclose what's going on. Um, in the work that I do with Troll Busters, um, my goal is really um, to, to help people understand about how to create and capture the contemporaneous evidence necessary so that when they choose to tell their story, they have the contemporaneous evidence to go to law enforcement and to others um, that validate that story. So, um, so that they can feel free to process and deal with what's happened with them in, in, a, in a way and in a time that gives them the agency and authority over what's happening to them. So I would, I would just add to that maybe the practical, unnecessary um, benefits of an ethical approach to organizing your newsroom and how the people who are telling, choosing who tells a story and why it's so important to have uh, diverse voices, diverse people within the newsroom. And this is another story from earlier in, in 
my career in 1990, uh, I spent six weeks in South Africa in the summer after Nelson Mandela came out of prison, and there was all this change of foot in South Africa. It was an incredibly exciting time to be there. And I had the great good fortune uh, to be able to make that trip with a, a photographer from the Post-Dispatch who was African-American uh, from East St. Louis, um, bigger than I am, uh, dark-skinned, and many people that we uh, met in South Africa thought he was African himself until he opened his mouth and you know, eventually spoke in this wonderful southern wall. And, they, and, and at that point, you know, most places where we went, particularly in black townships, it meant that I suddenly had access and I could talk to people because they were disarmed by him. They were so you know, charmed by, by, by this uh, unusual man that they were meeting. He was a wonderful person to be with in any case. And, and with many white South Africans, we had the same experience, except when we got to the point where we were doing a feature on the uh, conservative party member of Transcribe, Transcribe uh, Farmers, I'm sorry, Transvaal from north of uh, Pretoria and Johannesburg, and they agreed to, to have us come to a profile of, of them on the farm. And then when they found out that I was coming with an African-American photographer, uh, they canceled, first canceled the interview, and then, and then we got them to say, so, well, you know, we're already, we were already in the town, so we got to this Transvaal small town, and where we, at that point, in South Africa, Adele and I could not, there, there was a white only hotel that, that only I could have stayed in, so we stayed in the other hotel, the only one in the town that it was not segregated. And they agreed at first only to meet us uh, in, a, in a public place, uh, because they wouldn't let us come to their house, they wouldn't let us see the farm uh, because of him. So then we, so I got to experience what it was like to be African American, that little bit, uh, to be uh, treated the way Adele was treated by them. But we were all <coughs> able to work together over the course of several days there, where we got them to let us you know, have them take the photographs, and we worked together. We did the story, and then four years later, we went back when South Africa had the election. And, and this family, we got to go back, and, and they sort of welcomed Adele and me, like old friends who were in their house, and sort of seeing the change in, in, in their attitudes. And that never would have happened if I hadn't had the, really the privilege to do this for somebody who had a background totally different from us. As an ethical issue, I mean, I, I take it in, I think here a couple of the FESPN stories, but now there's uh, a couple of other arms and other outlets in terms of outlets that should know better, but really kind of have fallen down, I think, on the ethical level and just in terms of also serving the media audience. And when you look at, you know, the New York Times has done, has effectively a war with it in its own newsroom on the subject of trans people and how to cover trans people. And those are reflected when you have newsers like that basically regurgitates everything that Tony Perkins has to say without actually providing any background information or anything other than, hey, Tony Perkins says a lot of hateful stuff, and we're just going to run it word for word. This is what he's going to say. That's not really helpful for anybody. I mean, that, unless you unless you want to turn the paper into you know, a dare sure arm. Um, it's frustrating when you run into you know, when they run into the circumstance of getting where particularly in the Chicago World Spanish and but I think in a lot of newspapers, um, you run into the issue of trans people who frequently are frequently um, unable to afford the privilege of changing their paperwork. They don't have the money, the access, um, education, the power, the ability to find online the organizations that might help them change the birth certificate or change their ID or anything. So that then when they're subsequently murdered, um, there's nobody there to basically, or certainly nobody on you know, the police wire, and you will probably end up with one story about like, you know, the victim and who they found. Um, but then you'll end up with the newspapers themselves running obits that do not reflect this person's life, who they were, who they knew, what they did, and uh, instead misgendered. And so it's kind of a final insult to you know this person's existence that they misrepresent their life. Um, it was kind of stunning. I had one particular uh, 
conference a couple of months ago where people who work on the open testing, including from the Washington Post, you know, made a point of saying that, uh, well, we don't think it's misgendering and we don't think it's misnaming or misrepresenting their lives because think of their high school classmates who might want to like learn what happened to their people they don't keep in touch with. It was stunning for them to have this presented as a defense, but that was the best they had as far as like saying, well, we just didn't want to correct you know, something that we did that was perhaps understandably wrong because we get it off the first water. Yeah, you can understand that mistake, but if you're not going to run a correction, or if you're going to, you know, like basically perpetuate this kind of misinformation about a person, that's deeply problematic. And when you're talking about people who are usually victims of sexual violence, and not part of somebody, you know, who's a victim of hate crime, um, to then have you know, journalists basically say, eh, "Not my watch, I didn't see it. I don't know. I don't need to know. I don't need to do this background. I don't need to tell a story." It's really too trouble, but it's unfortunately too common a factor, and even some of our most respectful journalistic institutions. That you're speaking to the secondary effects on our sources. Um, I'm in lots of spaces where we're talking about, you know, whether it's changing journalism education or how we deal with news on the local level, etc. And I don't think we train or help our students or. Uh, early career journalists understand the effects of our work on our audiences. Um, I don't think they understand the deep anger and distrust in communities of color and in our rural communities of journalists to be able to represent their stories fully, to represent their stories in a way um, that uh, provides that um, deep uh, context to their lives um, and in a way that protects them from the after effects of our work. And so we operate on a 24-7 cycle and move on to the next story and don't recognize the very deep ways the impact of our stories on the lives of our sources who then become under attack online for having spoken to us on record. And so um, there are significant effects that continue to ripple out into people's lives after we moved on to the next topic. And I think the, that, that cavalier nature um, to the work, um, the disposable nature of our sources and their lives that we've exposed and, and put out um, in broadcasts and other ways um, makes the work that we do very problematic and makes journalists actually complicit in reinforcing the kinds of bad behaviors that we see. Um, I know online, um, my work has changed dramatically in the past two years, but if you look online at the attacks by people in our highest offices on April Ryan or Michi Alcindor or Julian Hill or Joy Reid or other women journalists of color or women journalists or women politicians, what we're seeing is a pattern of silencing that goes across the board to any woman who would dare to open her mouth online. And I think journalists can and do um, play a role in reinforcing those kinds of behaviors by not uh, seeking out the diverse sources, by not um, making clear to them uh, the impact of the work that they may be doing, by not paying attention to the harm that might be done um, by disclosing someone's identity in a way that puts them at risk both online and in physical space. And so I think as we look to kind of the ethical issues, um, what role do journalists play? Um, our own journalists need to understand the ways in which they played into the strategies um, of propaganda and the strategies of um, misinformation um, just by, um, by almost having the hubris that because we're doing the good work, we can't possibly be doing wrong. Right? That we're so mission driven and speaking truth to power that we can't possibly be the ones that are actually complicit in, in suppressing and doing damage to large communities of people. Oh. I just add one, one other point to that that I, I think it speaks to Michelle you mentioned the sort of the, the crisis that we're facing in, in local journalism increasingly. 
the, the, the ability to sustain uh, local and regional media outlets around the country. And that's affected the work that, that we do at the Pulitzer Center, which we started 13 years ago now with the focus thinking that we were going to fill gaps in international coverage. That was almost entirely you know, our niche that we were, that we were doing. And, and, and we've increasingly come to see that we have to be engaged with uh, smaller outlets around the country because there, there are less and less of them, less and less resources in, in journalism doing it. And if we're going to engage the community and, and bring these diverse perspectives to them, uh, we're going to have to do it in partnership with um, whatever local, bullying local news outlets we can find. And so on um, issues like mass incarceration, gun violence, uh, the border, migration, uh, climate change, all of which are, are huge issues facing our country. Um, we are more and more at the Pulitzer Center in that space domestically as well as internationally for that reason, because it's, we, think it's, we think it really is an ethical responsibility that we're going to address these systemic issues. We, we have to find ways to do it. And it also fits into the education of the fact that, 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 that we've made uh, outreach in, in secondary middle schools and colleges and community colleges, universities. Uh, a central part of the mission of the Pulitzer Center. We want to take that journalism and use it to engage uh, people who right now are so siloed and are all so divided that they listen only to the people that are, are, are echoing our own views. And so, so you have to, again, it gets to intentionality and being proactive, trying to go out. How do you find ways to go out and engage a cross section of people to talk about the issues that affect us all? That's what we're trying to do. I think this is all so important, and I want to make sure that our, our audience gets to ask at least a couple of questions here before we segue into lunch. We've got just a little bit of time, um, so let's let's get started, and I'm just going to let the microphones make the decisions here. <laughs> Hi there. Um, I am Dr. Palmer. I'm one of your students here. Um, so uh, I've had the pleasure of being able to read um, some of Christina's reporting, and it was really helpful in our class about gender and sexuality representation in the media. And I'm wondering, from each of you in your different fields, what steps are being taken to address the issue of bias and harassment in your workplaces and in your spheres of influence? I've heard in the last panel from Dr. Steiner about how we need to teach students to prepare them for harassment in the workplace, but I just keep hearing that the onus is on the people who are being harassed. And I think none of this is going to change until we redirect that energy to prevention. And prevention is really about teaching consent and respect and empathy primarily to men who are the primary um, offenders in terms of harassment and um, morally permissible reporting. So I'm just curious in what university setting, nonprofits, a great uh, national media organization, what's being done to address that? Well, I, I'll I'll take the lead on this one because thank you for reading my words. So now that I'm stuck in administrative as an editor, uh, I don't get to write as often. So. But um, I think, you know, like this is one where the benefit of having women in particular on your team editorially or determine what's the story when you're dealing with particularly fractious something like that. The, this came up a couple of years ago, for instance, when Jose Reyes came back from, um, was coming back off of the suspension for hitting up his wife. And the journalist we had on site writing about it talked about, like, well, this is going to be great for the Mets. They're finally getting a veteran player back. It's awesome that they're finally at full strength. They're going to do better. It's going to be good for them in standing. Some people cheer. And it's like, okay, this is not in my boss who is also. Like we both looked at this and said, we're not writing that story. This is not the story about Jose Reyes' comment. This is a story about domestic abuse. And this is a story where if we don't get into that, we're not talking about what's important about like why Jose Reyes is a news story, or was he, and why. And 
if we don't get into all of the reasons why Angle and Facebook did suspend, you know, then we're not going to write or publish this kind of raw, raw story about, like, you know, go Mets. I don't want to talk about go Mets in a story about domestic abuse. Um, but again, this is where we're dealing with an older, like, position of a you know, writer who just was not clear on, like, you know, what the angle was. You know, well, well, I'm not comfortable writing about that. Okay, well, then somebody else is going to have to write this, but you're that what you've given us is very nice, but it's not going to supply it. Like personal, you no. Know. Um, and that's you know frustrating, but that's also running up against limitations. Um, beer talent is also something you're going to have to work around or work with. Um, but this is where, like you know, being particularly when you're talking about sports, which is you know so important to so many people's lives in terms of like, entertainment value or whatever that. You know, like you get this kind of phenomenon, stick to sports and sort of push back. And it's like, look, larger issues within our society also occur within sports. So we can't stick to sports. We have to talk about what the a story. And if it happens to be about like the box score, that's one thing. But if it happens to be about domestic abuse, we have to talk about it. We should. And we should be talking about players abusing or players abusing anybody, but particularly their wives or girlfriends or people. You know, maddening that people say, well, I don't want to read about that because it's sports. And it's like, well, it's news, it's important, and it's what we're going to cover. I hear your, your concern about the having to take the word words. I see it every day with people saying, I've got, to, I've got to defend this online. I've got to be the one to educate people. I'm the one under attack, and yet I'm having to do the emotional labor and work to try and train people to better. <laughs> I'm the ally, just yeah, getting better. Um, and there is a certain amount of um, self-preservation that needs to happen in terms of protecting yourself, et cetera. So I think uh, giving yourself the choice um, to focus on self-care um, rather than on teaching and educating others. Um, I think there has to be that healthy balance. Um, the other thing, if you noticed in my bio, I not only focus on issues of gender, but I also focus on media entrepreneurship. And so, as Kara mentioned earlier, I think it's critical that we create our own voices, that women are in power and in positions of power, people of color, and that we create and run our own platforms where we have the ability to be able to make those choices. I'd like to keep you talking, Professor. Um, one of the things we're encouraging many journalists to do is be engaged. But the risks of online engagement are so strong for women, for people of color. Can you tell everyone more about troll busters and how you are using technology as a response to the misuse of technology? I think one of the key things, um, thank you, Linda. <laughs> Oh, no, Jill. Absolutely, <laughs> Jill. Um, is that um, we needed to raise awareness, and so using the tools and technologies of social media monitoring, etc., to help elevate and create the picture of what's happening across the globe, not just here in the U.S., etc. So a lot of the research that's been happening has really been about surfacing about how this is a daily behavior for journalists. And not just journalists that are in the field and working in outlets, but student media. Uh, women and women of color and people of color and student media are under attack to derail them from going into journalism careers. And so this is very organized behavior and really helping to elevate and let people know what's happening in that space. Secondly, Trollbusters uh, does that monitoring, but we also will jump into that space. So understanding the environment, it's kind of like flying in a plane, um, you know, put on your own uh, mask first. We don't want you jumping in as a bystander, not understanding the water that you're swimming in and the kinds of sharks that are there. And so how can we train people to be safe bystanders to be able to jump in and protect themselves? Um, some of the other work that we're doing is a program that actually is rolling out next week Wednesday called Shine and Dime. It's a weekly, um, almost like a weekly AA meeting for online abuse, uh, where people can anonymously join us online in webinar format, where we talk about what's happening online, help educate them about the dynamics of online threats, 
and then give them an opportunity to share their story and get emotional as well as technological, psychological, maybe management support. Um, I'm also working with major media entities to help them look at all the ways and processes in which they um, really um, force the actions of their people. And so helping them look at their social media policies. Um, and my own students, uh, I constantly do training, I Skype them to classes, etc., to help them understand this environment. But for uh, many people, I'm counseling the younger folks who do not have a reputation yet to use a pen name. And just as women in the past use initials or their middle name or something else, um, using a pen name that breaks their identity, their professional identity from their private one and gives them the space so that the online attacks don't move into physical space um, that can be very paralyzing and damaging to them in their careers. We have time for, unfortunately, only one more question, and then we've got to go to lunch. <laughs> we must eat. So one more question, and then we'll wrap up for today. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for your uh, um, Michelle, I was really struck by your opening story, so thank you for sharing your experience. I want to be an encourager uh, for individuals who produce material that we're really passionate about. My question for the panel is, how an employer or a news editor might interact with a team in instances where there's a healthy dialogue over some time-sensitive decision that might be mutually favorable? And while I'm, I'm really happy about the uh, story that you shared, I guess the follow-up to that is, might there have been a scenario where your copy editor got the AP story out, out over in that edition? I, you know, I'm just trying to ask sort of like the other side of how how an editor works with the team um, in kind of coming up with, you know, like could there have been another edition or another story? It's how do, how does a how does a producer work on the team? To, uh, so newspapers and, and media entities operate as agenda-setting organizations. They set the agenda on what stories get in the newspaper, who they talk to, what the focus of that story is, the angle of the approach, when it's going to be delivered online, how they engage in their online spaces, what platforms, whether it's Instagram or Twitter or whatever, that they choose to push that out on. So when I look at a media organization and I talk to them about online harassment and how they need to focus their attention, I look at the workflow from beginning to end, and including all the people in between, their cybersecurity teams, their IT teams, uh, human resources, their legal teams, to help them understand first and foremost, um, because they've minimized this behavior before and they don't have processes in place for reporting, they're totally blind to uh, what's happening under the surface and how it affects um, their work. Not only does it affect the individual journalists, it affects the news enterprise as a whole, the self-censorship that goes on from people who, and women, people of color, whoever's experienced this kind of online harassment, uh, undergo a significant process of self-censorship where they're using their keyboard basically as a divine tool to try and figure out, if I say it this way, are the online trolls going to come after me? If I write this angle, um, who's going to come after me? To the point where they won't go to certain places or pursue certain stories because of those fears. That's exactly what the behavior is designed to do. And so I think it's helpful to really step back and look at the larger news enterprise, understand the ways in which we have forced um, because we went through this pendulum in journalism about transparency and authenticity and being our authentic selves online and in social media so that our audience knows us, we put ourselves at risk and in a space that we really didn't understand the implications and consequences of that kind of behavior. So helping management understand uh, who's the point of contact when something happens like this? How can somebody report it to a peer or somebody else who's not their manager that's going to take them off that beat or retaliate against them in some other kind of way? How
how can we then support that person in letting them disengage from social media in a way that gives them the space to be able to process what's happened to them? How can we um, let them know about the options that they have to suggest the colleague go out with them on a Facebook live shoot so that they're not they are trying to manage social media, look through the lens, and can't be aware of their own surroundings to be able to protect themselves in physical space. There's so many ways in which we do our work that we put ourselves at risk, um, that we um, we really can and should put questions in about whether we can make those choices at that time. Should we put our byline in the story? Sometimes we need to make the choice to say staff report and not put the byline of the journalists on the story so that we can protect them from the backlash of those stories. We are speaking truth to power against powerful people who would seek to destroy the truth and destroy our ability to be able to, to promote that truth. And so I think there's key ways in which management needs to um, understand that and uh, put in place the procedures to be able to protect their talent and let them know what choices they have to be able to protect themselves. Say that uh, more broadly, that the one silver lining in a, in a really dark cloud of uh, the commercial, the collapse of commercial journalism that we've all seen in the last uh, 15 or 20 years is that news organizations of every size are far more open to, to outside perspectives. And, and, and that's the, the role that, the, that we play at the Pulitzer Center. There are a number of other organizations like the Pulitzer Center that are now engaged with um, outlets as big as the New York Times and, and as, as, as uh, regional as the, the Half Times here or the, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Uh, and, and are able to sort of bring these kinds of perspectives, these concerns that Michelle and Christina and I have been talking about, uh, to the attention of the local uh, and national news editors and, and can, can spark a conversation about how we do the journalism and what types of issues need to be covered. That was much more difficult to have that conversation uh, years ago when every, when, every, when every news organization saw itself as, as, as Deep and low and sort of thing and not open to those kinds of conversations. I, I guess we've had the benefit of having, I think, both, you know, like negative after action and evaluations of things we've done. Um, and we've profited from those conversations. I mean, for the story is a case of the Dr. B story. Um, one of the benefits of you know, commercial journalism is that but okay, we screwed and had we not do this again, how do we go forward and do these kinds of sort of right or well? Um, I think the binders on the experiences of women in sports that I think could be generically kind of associated with all sports journalism um, has radically changed in our lifetimes when you look at, like, I think some of the necessarily you know, like truth telling about like what happened with the um master story and they're enabling you know one guy to basically be a serial sexual assaulter um and institute how they protected it and allowed him to continue to do this with generations of athletes um i don't think that story gets told as effectively or as well, unless you have women in the industry, unless you have people who understand what this is really about, as opposed to, well, boys will be boys. I don't think 20 years ago you could tell that story. Well, I mean, on the other hand, 20 years ago, I mean, you know, I'll call it like Norman Wheeler and uh, Eric and John, all sorts of people apologizing for Bill Clinton in the mainstream media for really or horrendous behavior, unfortunately. So I think, you know, learning from mistakes is unfortunately, you know, that's, if you don't make a mistake, you know, it's better to get something out of it. Um, I think every journalist will want to make mistakes and to learn from. Uh, the benefit, again, of working with patients, lean on your team. I'm not sure about this. I think we can do this better. Or how can I write this kind of story more effectively? Don't be afraid to put yourself out there. General kind of contradicts what you said. I totally agree with what you're saying. But don't be afraid to use your teammates. You know, I receive the benefit of 
is the room. The women who first went in the locker room, uh, like he or Claire Smith or Susan Slusser, like women sports journalists who were police were all like part of the boys' training. You're going into the locker room, how's it going? You bet your back. Find allies, lean on them when you need them, when you will need them, no matter who you are, but you can definitely get a benefit from their experiences and the hard things that you have heard stories that you don't want to run. Well, on that note, I'd love for us all to give a round of applause. <laughs> conversations uh, this morning. What we'd love for you to do is grab some food beyond that wall, and there's some lovely tables out in that open space. We'd love for you to continue the conversation, and on those tables, you're going to find some pieces of paper. It would be great if you could generate some story ideas, things that we could share and try to push out from the center so that we're covering things beyond um, this conference today and trying to create some lasting resources. So uh, give us some things to do, either us or, or some of our employment partners, that's the thing people that we stay in touch with. We'd love to get your ideas from your conversation as well. So um, if you could do that, that'd be great. Or if you just want to have a sandwich and chat, that's funny too. All right, so thank you everybody. We're going to be a little bit off schedule, but we're going to come back and have 1.30 for the presentation of the Indonesian Award.